Let's take a look at a structure known as Pascal's triangle. The way we form it is we start at the top with one and we in fact continue putting the one down the sides of a triangle. We're going to expand the triangle with rows as we go along. Ones are always going to be on the rightmost and the leftmost side. So for the next row, we can put a one at the beginning and at the end. And the way that we form numbers in the middle is by adding the two above. So the two numbers diagonally from above will be added together to produce a number that goes in the next position. 1 plus 4 is 5. 4 plus 6 goes here. That will be 10. 6 plus 4 is 10 again. And 4 plus 1 is 5. And notice that all the previous rows are formed the exact same way. So 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 1 is also 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. 3 plus 3 is 6, and so on and so forth. And so we can construct the rest of the triangle the same way. Now, so far, it just seems like a cute little structure. What is the use of it? And the use of it is thinking about what the nth row will look like. And for example, what does the n plus first row look like? And what do these numbers generally represent? Like, is there any other way to interpret these numbers um, that appear in the triangle as opposed to just having the pattern of following the triangle? Let's see what we can do by first considering what's called Pascal's formula. So I have two integers, r and n, and r is going to be less than or equal to n. And the formula corresponds to the following combinations n plus 1 choose r is equal to n choose r minus 1 plus n choose r. There are different ways in which we can prove it. One proof is by induction, which is a technique that we will see in the next section. Uh, but before we can do that and practice with that, we're going to actually prove it combinatorially using counting. So let's take a look at the left-hand side. Left-hand side is n plus 1 choose r. In thinking of the actual um, counting, this represents the number of ways to pick r elements, to pick or choose r elements, remember order doesn't matter, from n plus 1 elements. So it looks like I have myself n plus 1 available elements and I'm choosing r of them. Looking at the right hand side, because the sides are equal, this is counting the same thing but in two different ways. So let's think about how else can we think about choosing r elements from n plus 1 elements. Let's do the n plus 1 elements in this way. So we're going to think of the first n elements as n elements, and then we're going to think of the last element as we're going to separate it from the pack. If I am to pick r elements from n plus 1, that means that I will either my selection will either include this special element or it will not. So those are going to be the two cases that I'm going to consider. I'm either going to pick the star element as part of my collection or not. What happens if I do pick this element as a part of my collection? So I have to pick R elements in total. I've already chosen this one which means that now I only have to choose r minus 1 remaining elements for my collection. And how much am I choosing from? Well, the total collection had n plus 1 elements. I've already picked 1, so I am choosing from the remaining n. n choose r minus 1. Let's go through this again. If I have to have this element as a part of my collection, that means that instead of choosing r, I will now only be choosing r minus 1 because this has to be part of my collection. And the rest r I am choosing from the remaining n elements. Or the other way to form my collection of r elements from n plus 1 elements is to not pick this element at all. So now my consideration is only around these n elements and I have to pick all of my r elements from here. So n choose r. The number of ways to pick r elements from n plus 1 elements is equal to the number of ways to pick 
r minus 1 elements from n plus the number of ways to pick r elements from n, which is exactly Pascal's formula. So it's counting the exact same phenomenon in two different ways, and because, of course, the answers have to be equal, we have ourselves a formula. Now, let's take a look at what this means for the actual triangle here. If you look closely at the row, so for example, this is row number five, what we can spot is that these are actually chooses. If you compute the numbers, that you will see that this is five choose zero, this is five choose one, this is five choose two, five choose three, five choose four, and five choose five. So the nth row of this table is always n choose zero, followed by n choose one, n choose two, and so on, all the way down to n choose n minus one, and then n choose n. This is also uh, like common sense check suggests that yes, the last two elements are going to be in fact ones, so that is true. And now what this formula gives us is proof essentially that the next row is going to look the way that we think it's going to look. First of all, remember that no matter what, I am going to back uh, or start it off with uh, n plus 1 choose 0. But then I have to add these two elements together. Adding these two elements together is essentially doing this arithmetic where r in this case is 1. So I'm going to have n choose 0 because r is 1 and n choose 1. If r is 1, this will produce n plus 1, choose 1. So here, the next element is n plus 1, choose 1, given to me by the addition of these two. Okay? And so on and so forth. This formula proves that this uh, triangle actually is formed this way all the way down into infinity. Right? If you add the two elements together, if you add the two um, chooses together, you will produce the next one that looks the correct way. Now, what? why is this useful? This is still just some kind of magical math triangle where we can turn the numbers into these ways to count elements. And the reason it's useful is because it has a direct connection to what we call binomial coefficients. So let's define a little bit of terminology here. The sum of two terms, a plus b, is called a binomial. Binomial because there's two of them, bi, no mil. So let's take a look at a few powers of the binomials. x plus y squared. Now this is where everybody is going to start making the same mistakes they've always made in algebra, so let's be careful about how we open up the brackets. The square doesn't just come down on two of them and that's the end of the, that's the, end of the road. The actual factoring out has to be done very carefully. So the square is the product of the same thing twice. And now, if I open up the brackets, I will see that I get x squared, followed by xy, followed by yx, so these are similar terms, we can put them together, followed by y squared. So I have the square term, 2xy, and then y squared, okay? So what happens a lot is that uh, people forget this middle term and simply bring the square down onto the two pieces. Okay, be careful. The middle term is most certainly there. Just because you ignore it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. For the cube, we're going to have to take out this bracket and multiply it by itself three times. I'm not going to actually go through all of the openings of the brackets, but we open up the first two, or you can think of like x times x times x will give you x cubed. And then we're going to have x times x times y, which will give you x squared y, and that, and so on and so forth. After putting together similar terms, we're going to get 3x squared y plus 3xy squared plus y cubed. All right. Now, this should already start to look kind of suspiciously familiar, being on the same page as my Pascal's triangle. If all I do is read off the number coefficients, I get 1 2, 1, which corresponds to this row of Pascal's triangle. My next one, 1, 3, 3, 1, corresponds to the third row of Pascal's triangle. So I wonder if that is the pattern that holds for the coefficients of the binomial going forward. Now, this is already getting a little out of hand to write out all the elements of, so let's start thinking more generally. 
Going through the fourth power, what does that mean? I'm going to once again have all my brackets, so in this case four, but instead of expanding them out, I'm going to think about where do those terms actually come from? When we multiply out the brackets, we take one term from each bracket. So for example, if I take a term x from here, in every bracket I only have two choices, x and y. So let's say I take an x from here and x from here, and then like a y from here and an x from here. That selection corresponds to the term x, x, y, x. So let's write it down, x, x, y, x, which of course, if I uh, put together the powers, will be x cubed times y. So all we're doing is going through all the possible ways to choose one of the two terms inside the brackets and that will form one of our actual terms. Now, some of them will be the same. So for example, x, x, y, x can be formed in the way I've just written it, or it can be formed as x, 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 y. That's a different way to form the exact same term, and therefore they will be put together similarly when we do our simplifications. Okay, so instead of thinking of um, how we can simplify them, let's think about how we can form them. What is the way to form the term x, 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 x? That means that in every bracket, I have to pick x. Out of the four brackets, I pick all four to choose x's from. Or I can think of it the other way around. I can think of that as out of all the four brackets, I choose zero brackets to pull the y out of, okay? So there are four choose zero ways to form this term. So let's write this down. This is out of four brackets, choose zero to have y from. What about this one, x, 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 y? So this is actually going to be similar to the term that I just chose. So that means that I have to have three x's and one y. So out of the four brackets, I have to choose the one bracket to pick y from, and then everything else will have to be a bracket that gets an x from. So out of the four brackets, I'm going to pick one bracket to choose my one y from. Okay, So this one corresponds to this y. And now you're seeing how the pattern will develop. If I have x, x, y, y, that means I need to pick two brackets to pick y out of, and therefore I will have four choose two. For the next one, I have x, y, 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 so I need three brackets to pick y from, so I'm going to have four choose three here. And for the last one, y, 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 I'm gonna have four choose four. So instead of writing it out this way, I can think of what the powers of the terms are. And this is going to tell me in how many different ways can I draw them from the bracket. And therefore, in how many different ways I can actually see this term happening. Okay, so now let's try to write this out. x plus y squared. So I'm going to have this term, which is x to the fourth. Well, let's actually start with a coefficient. So there are four choose zero ways to have a term that is x, 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 and zero of the y's. So four x's, none of the y's. The next term is going to be this one. There are four choose one ways to pick the brackets so that I have three x's and one y. So three x's and one y. Next up, let me move this over. Next up, I have um, this term. There are four choose two ways to have two x's and two y's. So four choose two, two x's, two y's. And going forward, I'm going to have four choose three, one x, three y's. And finally, four choose four, um, no x's, but four y's. Now we're really seeing why the Pascal formula and Pascal triangle have these coefficients there, have these chooses that appear throughout here. 
because that is also exactly what's going to form the coefficients in our binomial expansion. This is also why the choose is called a binomial coefficient, because these are precisely the numbers that occur in the expansion of the binomial forms. And of course, because the Pascal's triangle keeps going, as per Pascal's formula, we can do that for any kind of binomial. So for the power of 5, all we have to do is think about the pattern we have just developed in terms of coefficients and in terms of the actual powers. So we start off with all x's and no y's. There are going to be five brackets in this case. The way to choose zero of them to contain y means I have five x's and no y's. Next up, I'm going to pick one bracket so that it has one y which means I'm going to have to have four x's, and so on and so forth. I encourage you to actually finish off writing up this format just so you get used to seeing how the binomial coefficients are formed. In general, we have the following result that is called the binomial theorem. And this simply just writes out in um, more general notation for general power n, what the expansion is going to be. So notice that the first and the last coefficients are 1 and are not present, but if you want to fill them out, these will be n choose 0 and n choose n. For every single coefficient in the middle, you're going to see that you're going to pick, let's say, from the n brackets that you're expanding out of, you're going to pick two brackets that contain y, and the rest of the brackets, so n minus 2, will have to contain x's. So whatever the number here is, it corresponds to the power of y and x in sort of either the positive or the negative direction. Now, we can apply this theorem to binomials that are not just x and y, but also have other coefficients within them. We just have to make sure that we implement them properly into, we can integrate them properly into the formula. So here I have the fifth degree, so my n is 5, so this is similar to the bottom example on the last page. So first I'm going to have 5 choose 0, and then my x term all to power 5. Now you got to be careful because my x term is no longer just x, it's 2x. So it's going to be 2x all to power 5, y to power 0. Notice that my power of 5 is on top of the entire 2x, not just x, okay? So if you wrote it's 2x to the fifth, this is wrong. The entire term 2x has to be under the power of 5. So be careful to actually put your brackets around it here. Next up is going to be 5 choose 1. My term 2x will have power 4, y will have power 1. Next up is going to be 5 choose 2, 2x will have power 3, y will have power 2, and so on for a few more terms. Also notice another pattern that you should, um, you can use to double check yourself. The powers on your terms will always add up to the total power because you have to make sure that you draw something from every single bracket. So the powers in their totality on every single, oops, on every single term have to add up to the total power of 5. So 4 plus 1, 3 plus 2, and so on. The other way we can approach this problem is to ask the reverse. If I have a term x plus y, uh, if I have a binomial x plus y to the fifth, I know that this term, x cubed y squared, has to occur somewhere within it because the sum of the powers here is equal to 5. So what the question might be is, what is the coefficient in front of this term? And here we have to think of how the pattern develops and what will be in front of this uh, particular term. Now, it's going to be the term that is analogous to this one in this expansion. So I can see the, that the coefficient here is going to be 5 choose 2. Remember I said that this number 2 uh, contributes to one of the powers positively and one of the powers negatively. So this is going to be 2 and this 3 is 5 minus 2. Now, alternatively... You can say that this term is actually going to be 5 choose 3 because we could have sort of swapped the roles of x and y and then this will occur just actually in the next step over. These numbers are the same, so this is not something you need to worry about. Both of these answers are going to be correct. 
Binomial, uh, binomial theorem is also a really nice tool to actually prove certain um, identities. So here is one of the most famous ones. We're going to prove that n choose 0 plus n choose 1 plus n choose 2 and all the way up to n choose n is equal to 2 to power n. So what this is saying in terms of the Pascal's triangle is that the sum of the entries in any row is equal to 2 to power of that row. So these are all of the same numbers. So what this is saying is that if we add all of these up to each other, they should equal to 2 to power n. Which means, for example, that if we add all of these numbers together, this should equal to 2 to the fifth, which if you add them together, you see that it will. Okay? This is a seems like a pretty powerful um, a pretty powerful observation. We are going to prove this in a few different ways. So proof number one will be by binomial theorem. So what I can do is I can notice that these are binomial coefficients the way they occur here exactly all the way up to n choose n. Except for in this expression here, I have no y's and no x's. So what am I supposed to do here? Well, what if I let x and y be simply 1? If I set them to be 1, I'm also quite aware of the fact that 1 to any power is just 1. So the terms here will all be 1's. And all I'm going to have left on the right-hand side are in fact these coefficients themselves, right? So let's write it out with ones just so we can see how that works. So I'm gonna have n choose zero, one to power n, plus n choose one, one to power n minus one, one to power one, plus n choose two, one to power n minus two, one to power two. You can see how silly that becomes because all I have are products of ones with the binomial coefficients. And then finally, n choose n, um, 1 to power n. Okay, so this is what the right-hand side of my binomial theorem looks like. What about the other side? x is 1, y is 1. So this whole thing is equal to 1 plus 1 to power n. 1 plus 1 to power n. While the products of 1s and the 1s to any power is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. So what we have here on the right-hand side is 2 to power n, and what we have on the left-hand side are just all the binomial coefficients, if I just take away the overly complicated representation here. So n choose 0 plus n choose 1 plus n choose 2, all the way up to n choose n, and on the right-hand side, 1 plus 1 to power n, so 2 to power n, and we're done with proving our formula. Isn't that nice? All we had to do was plug in 1, and the result with this type of counting was immediate. This is fantastic. The other way to prove, uh, there's a number of different ways to prove it. Again, we can prove it using induction, which is the technique that we're going to learn in the next uh, section. Or we can actually prove it using counting. So if you remember, maybe, the expression like this, we've already seen before. This, in fact, is what represents the number of subsets of a set with n elements. Number of subsets of set with n elements. How can we see that uh, directly? So my set has n elements. So let's say my set is a1, a2, a3, and so on, all the way up to a n. Uh, if I'm counting subsets, I should count them by size. So how many subsets are there that have size 0? Well, out of the n elements, I'm going to choose 0 elements to form my subset. Or my subset can be of size 1. So out of the n elements, I'm going to choose 1 element to form my subset. Or my subset can be of size 2. And we're already seeing how this summation is getting formed, all the way up to my subset being able to be of size m. Now, that's all great. So I have that. But how do I get to 2 to the n? Well, for 2 to the n, we're going to count the exact same thing, but in a different way. So if I am thinking of all of these elements, how can I form a subset? I have n elements here, right? Maybe let me actually um, draw out the 
spots. In order to form a subset, I have to think of each element as being a part of a subset or not a part of a subset. So in fact, I can think of them as strings of sort of like in or out. So the first element when I'm forming my subset can be in the subset or not. So there's two choices for that to happen. The second element can be in my subset or not. So there's two choices for that to happen and so on and so forth all the way down because I have to form all of them Overall, I'm going to get 2 to the n. So counting the number of subsets by size gives me this expression. Counting the number of subsets by inclusion of the elements gives me 2 to the n. And because the numbers have to actually coincide, I have the expression that I was asked to prove in the first place. Okay? That is one of the strengths of mathematics. You can prove the same thing using different methods and using very different techniques, right? We can actually see this result in two very, very different ways. And that is kind of amazing. Uh, binomial theorem also has a cute application to express things in base 9. And then once that is done, in base 3. And that is simply by the fact that we can write 10, our current base, decimal base, as 9 plus 1. Okay, so there's again this kind of like the plus one thing that occurred in the simplifications earlier. So now what we can take a look at is the binomial expansion of 10 to power n. So instead of saying it's 10 to power n, we're going to write it as 9 plus 1 to power n and then use the binomial expansion on that. Okay, so let's go through with this. Remember, we're picking the power, so n choose 0, 9 to power n times 1 to power 0, plus n choose 1, 9 to power n minus 1, 1 to power 1, plus n choose 2, 9 to power n minus 2, times 1 squared, and so on, all the way down to n choose n. Okay? Now, of course, as before, I can notice that 1 to power anything is just 1, so I can simplify this expression. n choose 0, 9 to power n. n choose 1, 9 to power n minus 1. n choose 2, 9 to power n minus 2, and so on. So let me write out that last term here. n choose n, 9 to power 0. And this is where I notice that this is how I can use um, this or I can view this as a base 9 representation. Remember that in different bases, what we have to do is go one at a time in representing the number as the power of the base. And here I have exactly that. 9 to power 0, there's going to be 9 to power 1, 2, 3, 9 to power n minus 2, n minus 1, all the way up to n. So all of the powers of 9 are present here, which means that all of the coefficients in front of them give me the representation of a number in base 9. Remember that I read the coefficients of a number to represent the actual digits in that corresponding base. So let's try it with an example. Let's say I wanted to do it with 10 cubed. So I can write it out as 9 plus 1 cubed. And so what I'm going to have is 3 choose 0, 9 cubed. Again, I'm going to now omit the writing out of the ones because I know that everything there is going to be just to power, a uh, 1 to some power, which is just 1. 3 choose 1, 9 squared. 3 choose 2, 9 to power 1. 3 choose 3, 9 to power 0. Okay, so now let's transform these into actual numbers. Now, we can actually use the Pascal's triangle for that because these are the exact same coefficients as above here. So these are all going to be coefficients in the Pascal's triangle. So this is going to be 1, 3, 3, 1, which means that in base 9, 10 cubed is equal to 1, 3, 3, 1. Isn't that amazing? All we have to do in order to write a power of 10 in base 9 is to look at the corresponding line in the Pascal's triangle. So 10 cubed in base 9 is 1, 3, 3, 1. 10 to the 5th in base 9 will be this number, 
one, five, ten, ten, five, one. We're going to have to work to figure that out, but it will allow us to get there faster. Now, the nice thing about the number nine is the fact that it's in fact a square. So nine is itself three squared, which means that we can actually take this expression and turn it into something that will be a representation in base three. Let's just do it with an example. So instead of looking at base nine, I would like to think about what that looks like in base three. So nine is actually three squared. So I'm gonna think of that as three squared and I'm going to write everything using the three squared. Okay, so you know what? In fact, I'm just gonna rewrite the numbers already. So I have one as a coefficient, but now instead of nine cubed, I have three squared cubed. Okay, so three squared, all cubed, plus, now my coefficient is three, nine squared, so three squared squared. Three times three squared to power one, and then one times three squared to power zero. Okay, so all I've done is I've replaced these nines by three squareds. Okay, just keeping very careful track of the fact that the powers like, for example, this square goes on top of the overall square. Okay, now let's actually do some uh, power simplifications. So what do I have here? I have 1 times 3 to power 2 times 3, so 6. 3 times 3 to power 4. 3 times 3 squared. And then 1 times 3 squared to power 0. So that's just 3 to power 0. Now I do notice one small issue, and that is the fact that I can actually combine these two together still into powers of 3, right? So I'm not done quite yet, so I have 3 to power 6. So now notice that this is actually 3 to power 1 times 3 to power 4, so I'm going to add the powers when I multiply by exponentiation rules. This is 3 to power 1 times 3 squared, so overall I have 3 cubed, and then 1 times 3 to power 0. Now I have everything written out as a power of 3. Now remember, when reading the powers off, I have to make sure to account for the ones that are missing. So I'm going to read from right to left, being careful not to miss anything. So in base 3 here, what am I going to have? I have 1 for power 0. There is no power 1. There is no power 2. There is a power 3. There is no power 4. There is a power 5. And there is a power 6. So this is the same number in base 3. Fantastic, isn't it? Binomial theorem is so useful in so many unexpected ways, which, is make it, which makes it such a wonderful result.